<laughs> so anyway, the lion's behind me and you can see him and I'm in the front. And then the trainer is behind the camera and he's got like a sirloin steak on a stick and he's waving it back and forth like this. So the lion behind me is going like this, sort of looking at the steak on the stick. And the only thing between the steak and, and the lion is me. <laughs> I'm back by popular demand in that I demanded to be back. Okay, well, I'm happy to have you back, RJ. Yeah, I'm <laughs> happy to be here for a variety of reasons, but also because today's guest was explicitly by my own request. You that said, if was. there's anyone you wanted to interview, let me know. You'll see what you could do. Before you finish the sentence, I said this man's name. It came from... I didn't even speak it. It came from inside my soul. It just <laughs> expressed its way out of me because I had to speak to him. I've had to speak to him for a number of years, quite frankly. And RJ, this is your moment. It's yeah. Happening. Okay. Let's not waste any more time. Okay. It's the moment you've been waiting for. He's heard this a thousand times, so I'm just going to breeze through it. The quarterback of question, the King Kong of knowledge, the Duke of discovery, the giantist of scientists, the Elvis of experimentation, the B-man himself. Ladies and gentlemen, give you the one... The only uh, Paul Zaloom. Hey. <laughs> How's it going? We're very excited, Paul. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm doing Perfect. well. Glad to be here. We're so happy to have you here. <laughs> I'm happy to be had. <laughs> well, let us have you at the beginning. You were born December 14th, 1951 in Garden City. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. Okay, my grandparents live in Garden City. What was a childhood summer like for a young Paul Zaloom? Uh, childhood summer. Um, well, the happiest summers I spent were in a Quaker summer camp mm. uh, in Vermont, actually, which totally changed my life and was really great. And I think it was four summers at the Farmer Wilderness Camps. Wow. And they were integrated since their founding in the late 1940s. And they sort of ran on Quaker principles of community and generosity and um, spirituality and that sort of thing. And uh, it was a great, great experience and led me in all kinds of directions, including the job I got on the TV show Beacon's World was a direct result of going to uh, summer camp, Quaker summer camp. Wow. Okay. So let's, but let's stay linear because I, <laughs> this is the way my notes work. So you, you went to uh, Choate prep school, Connecticut. Yes. You weren't a fan of it. You didn't gel with it. You said, I'm done with school when you finished this. Yeah. I was a uh, exchange student with the Putney school, which was more to my liking. Um, it was a, progressive high school in uh, private school in uh, Southern Vermont. Um, but, you know, I got, I, I got a pretty good education in grade school and high school for which I'm grateful and uh, ended up going to hippie college. So it was a good thing. I had some serious studies. And uh, yes. In my so youth. Tell me about hippie college. You stumble <laughs> upon <laughs> the bread and puppet theater and you said this, this is my purpose. Yeah, the Hippie College is uh, Goddard College in Plainfield, Vermont, which is still around, and they have a low residency uh, program there. And um, basically, it was the one school that had no requirements and no rules. You weren't allowed to have a gun or a, a dog, but everybody had a dog, and there was a guy who used to walk around the campus all the time with a gun and a black trench coat, like shooting at stuff. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty wild. So pre God, pre God, pre um, Columbine. Uh, but he was, you know, he was a nice guy. He didn't shoot any of the students, you know, which is that's important. Very, yeah, it was very gracious of him not to do that. But uh, and yeah, I just sort of majored in vodka with a minor in mescaline for like uh, <laughs> a, you know a year, and then I ran into the Bread and Public Theater, who uh, was sort of a neo German expressionist anarchist. Uh, puppet theater uh, that was in residence at the college and I saw one of the shows and it blew my mind and uh, I've been involved ever since which has been now 51 years I think. That's awesome it's like you you fell into your calling and do you happen to remember maybe some of the first household items that you turned into puppets or object animation? 
Well, I started doing objects because um, I want to start doing my own work once I graduated from Goddard. Uh, and I wanted to have more of a kind of an American sensibility uh, that was not, I mean, I love the German expressionists and the uh, new objectivity, and I love German art and culture very much, and I'm fascinated by German history, but I'm an American, I'm crass, I'm a comedian. <laughs> So I thought it would be funny to kind of take the Klaus Oldenburg uh, slash Marcel Duchamp route of taking ordinary objects and animating them as puppets, um, taking the detritus and the garbage of society and making little satirical, political, hyperactive, super fast puppet shows uh, using that garbage. Huh. Oh, but I, what objects? I'm sorry. I. Uh, a plastic rose was played mommy in that show. <laughs> As you and do. I had, uh, gosh, what, what was the dad character? I don't even remember. The, the backdrop was a piece of linoleum from the 1950s that I had peeled off some floor somewhere. Um, and I remember the dog was a little plastic crocodile. And uh, I, gee, I, there was a bologna package in it. I Yeah, I don't remember. It's... It's all in one ear and out the other one. If I'm not dealing with it on a daily basis, you know, it's like gone. Fair enough. A little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And then I went on to make many uh, found object shows uh, and also expanded into um, marionettes and Boon Raku style puppets and hand puppets, shadow puppetry, uh, ventriloquism, um, what else? Uh, like Sicilian style marionettes with the hard rod, a little bit of that. Rod puppets, you know, just I, I once had the goal, like, I want to master every form of puppetry, which is not only an incredibly uh, arrogant, blowhard goal, but <laughs> I figured, what the hell else am I going to do? So that's what, what I did. And I don't know if I mastered it. but <laughs> What form of puppetry is left that you haven't touched? Is there any Moby Dick of puppetry for you? <laughs> Not really. Uh, I mean, I haven't done Muppet style mouth puppets, although I did perform mm. one in a short video. But I agree with the Henson family that the Muppet style puppets should really only be done by the Muppets. And so uh, it but I did I did want so I com kind of completed the list by doing that. Nice. Well, I know, uh, RJ, you wanted to ask about Muppets, so what do you think? Yes. So, according <laughs> according to my research, and correct me if I'm wrong, you were an uncredited puppeteer on the 1979 Muppet movie? Oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> okay. and, and uh, Fantastic. And then, were you or were you not a puppeteer on the 1987 Inner Tube, Jim Henson's yeah. pilot? Yes, I was on that show. Yeah. Because Jim was... A, One for two. Yeah, Jim was a big fan. <laughs> and he used to come to my shows. He was a very gracious, sweet guy. Um, always enjoyed his company. I, I played at their place on 69th Street for a party. A re, was it a retirement party or something? Um, but anyway, he Jim said... Um, he said, let's we're doing this TV project and I, you know, I'd love you to do one of your found object things. And so I did, we did this whole blue screen thing and it was not so much. It wasn't so hot. <laughs> it's a very, it was a very strange show. I've seen clips from it in yeah. a tube in general. It was a, it was a big attempt. It was a big swing. Shall we yeah. say? Yeah. It was not, it wasn't so hot, but you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. It happens frequently <laughs> in the world of entertainment. You know, it's just some stinkaroos are going to happen. I was also on uh, Sesame Street um, about 10 years ago, I think, or 11 years ago. And uh, I was in New York doing a show at uh, Dixon Place downtown. I was doing my White Like Me, a hunky-dory puppet show about um, the glorious Caucasian race and white man. <laughs> white man. And um, and I got a call from the Sesame Street people, and they said, oh, you come on the show as a puppeteer. 
because they have like doctors and postmen and nurses and uh, all those people will go on the show and talk about their profession to, you know, to the puppets or whatever. And um, so I went on as a puppeteer and I said to them, well, why don't I bring my ventriloquial figure, Butch Manley, and I could <laughs> sort of set it up as an intro because kids know that as a puppet and then segue into the found objects. And they were like, no, we don't want you to do that. <laughs> so I brought him to the shoot anyway. And I went to the director and I said, so what about having this, you know, I'll do a little vent thing and then segue. Or say, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. So that's what we ended up doing. <laughs> And it was That's... really fun. My grandkids <laughs> came all the way down from Vermont and they shot Aww. B-roll in the park while I was uh, doing the episode. So yeah, it was fun. And I think that's a good message too, that if someone tells you no, then you can ask again till you get a yes, especially if your idea is fantastic. Yeah, it's obnoxious, but you know, <laughs> I was like, I wasn't getting paid. So, um, and what was odd was here I was on a show and my profession was a puppeteer and I'm talking to puppets who are not puppets. I mean, they're characters. Or I don't know what the hell they are, but they're not puppets. So I couldn't say, yeah, puppets like you. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't do that. Um, so, yeah. It was, it's very meta. In a it's sense. so meta. Yeah. yeah. It was like meta meta. Now, now uh, go ahead. Roger. Go ahead. Please, no, no, I insist. Thank you. You're so kind. I was going to ask, uh, Paul, if you have a favorite Muppet or a favorite uh, puppet, maybe from Sesame Street or from the Muppets. Um, I think Soupy Sales, White Fang, um, and Pookie. This is totally idiotic, terrible puppetry, <laughs> but so stupid, so hip. But White Fang and Bluetooth on the Soupy Sales show was a kid show that very much inspired Beekman. And it wasn't educational. It was majority uh, adult audience, same as Beekman, actually. 52% of the audience for Beekman's World was adults. Um, but the Soupy Show, like the Wall Street stopped, and it all, <laughs> it, the whole New York anyway, everyone just stopped what they were doing and watched the show because it was so out there. And so he had this character... Uh, white fang and then bluetooth and it would come in from the wing and it would just be a hairy arm and that's all you would see so what was so great about it was the kids had to imagine what the rest of the thing looked like and it mm -hmm. used the edges of the screen as a proscenium you know what i'm saying because of the influence probably of vaudeville now we think of the of this space as being just the world we don't think of it having edges like um this edge and that you play the edge as something that's funny you know that's just not done it's like using the screen as a, as a puppet stage so the hand would come in and soupy would be there and he'd look up at, at the beast and um it would go <laughs> and then soupy would translate and there'd be some stupid stupid joke and then he'd throw a pie in soupy's face and uh yeah, I I, uh, I loved uh, I loved the soup. Fabulous. <clears throat> now, physically speaking, you're the, the thing that uh, boggles me a lot about your puppetry is that you're very involved in it. You weren't exactly just crouched behind a desk the whole show, and you seem to be a very physical, animated performer. Yeah, I. Uh, there are some forms of puppetry where you end up behind a rag, a screen, whatever. And it's difficult for me because as a performer, your eyes, you're always looking at the audience and interpreting their reactions and being perceptive to them. And if you're behind a rag and you can't see them, you don't have, it's very hard to read the room. You can still sort of read it just by listening to the amount of fidgeting and like if fidgeting, that's a bad sign. If you, <laughs> If you hear people moving around, it's time to like take the bus out of town. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I remember like doing Beekman shows. The, I would do live stage shows as Beekman and I toured all over the country, played big houses like thousand seat houses. There were times when those kids were so quiet and they were often during the science explanations, which was kind of amazing. 
And they were, I love playing to kids because they have a totally different sense of humor and getting them to laugh is like tickling them. It was just so much fun. And the teachers, uh, many of the teachers were like, oh my God, that's so vulgar or whatever. Because I was, you know, burping and farting and all this stuff that we did on Beekman's World that kids love. It's like porno for kids. They go, ape shit. <laughs> Adults love it too. Just saying. So. Say it again. Adults love it too. We love it just as much. Can't go wrong with a fart, really. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, uh, that was a long answer to a short question. And um, I have a tendency to diverge from the subject at hand. Diverge away. Uh, so go, go ahead. Go ahead. I insist. I continue okay. to insist. <laughs> so obviously talking about Beekman's World and we, we've led to this point in your career. How much information did you have going into the show and how much were you able to improv uh, during the show and at your audition? Well, the audition, the reason I got the job was that I knew a girl in the Quaker summer camp I went to. Her brother became a, a producing partner of a guy named Jay Dubin. Jay was hired to direct the show, The Beekman's World, and his producing partner at the time said to him, I know this guy, he does puppets, blah, blah, blah. And we ended up meeting each other and pitching a show to HBO. It never went anywhere. But then a number of years later, he thought of me and thought, oh, maybe he would work for this show. And so I, um, I flew out to Hollywood and I had a sleepless night because I was really nervous. And I was wearing a lab coat and I did, you know, I sort of had a beaker of water and a couple of props and I was doing my thing or whatever. And at one point I knocked something over and in the theater, if you work in comic theater, often you have things go wrong. So you ad lib, you make it up, you, you know, you go with the flow. And the civilians love that because they think, oh, my God, how did he do that? That's like magical to the civilians. And, and these folks weren't civilians, but they're you know, they're not performers, they're Hollywood, you know, execs or whatever. So that sort of sealed the deal. It's like, oh man, the guy's off the cuff, bing, bam, boom. And in terms of ad-libbing, we did some of that on the stage when we were shooting the show. Um, we always had scripts, we had them on a monitor. We would ad-lib in rehearsal. We were always trying to lard the thing with more jokes and add particularly visual jokes and visual gags. Because the director, Jay Dubin, he he is a genius at the visuals, at framing with the camera. He knows all the tech to do with shooting and editing everything. Totally familiar with it. He knows science in and out. And he's got a fantastic New York, Coney Island sense of humor. So he was really, really crucial to the success of the show. So on that subject, could you explain the signature shooting technique of you guys moving between cameras. It's one of those things that you don't see until you mention it. Right. And then it becomes clear what you're doing. Who came up with that? That was Jay's idea. And he had the two cameras like right next to each other, touching each other and very close to the performers. And instead of uh, the, what we did was we would move from camera to camera and they would pick up the cut on the move. It's just not done very often. Um, I don't pay a lot of attention <laughs> to what's going on with this stuff, even though I make, I've made a feature film, made some movies and stuff. But uh, anyway, it was quite a learning curve to learn how to move from one camera over to the other side and often grabbing a cast member and taking them with me. <laughs> Uh, so it was this sort of choreographed dance that we would do back and forth between the two cameras. Cameras had ultra wide angle lenses. So it's like one step down from a fisheye. And he always wanted my hands like in the frame like this, because he did the crazy Eddie commercials in New York. Uh, ah. Prices are insane. So, uh, that, you know, that obviously influenced him. Um, and I, you know, I was involved in the creation of the show. I wasn't given credit and I wasn't paid, but I figured, yeah, you know, I come from the world where we don't get paid anyway. So might as well volunteer because I figured it would be fun. So I did. I was there for a few months before the show went on the air to help create it. 
Um, so like the, the character I was talking about based on um, White Fang that comes from the side, you know, Ray, who was the assistant off camera, that was sort of a tribute to Soupy. Um, and that was an idea I, uh, I believe I came up with. And then there's other stuff like the sound effects and the fact that uh, uh, Lester the Rat didn't have sleeves, that he had the cheese rolled up in the T-shirt. That was something I, I came up with. And um, But it was very collaborative. It was very fun. And that's the world I come from, the sort of avant-garde puppet world where we make up stuff, we invent stuff. We, our process involves a lot of improvisation and goofing around. Um, and it was a great atmosphere. We had a hell of a lot of fun. You could tell. <laughs> Good. Now, uh, an interesting uh, part was that uh, Mark Ritz, who played Lester the Rat, was originally a puppeteer, and the rat was a puppet. I saw a, an early footage of that, and because of where the puppet was, you couldn't even do that camera technique because there, yeah, there was a lot of moving around. And, you know, I'm a puppeteer. I love puppets. But what we always say in puppetry is, why are you using a puppet? Why? You have to have a really compelling reason. And all that thing did was talk. And that's the worst thing puppets do is talk. The best thing they do is move and do the Watusi and do somersault, have their heads fly off, have their eyes pop out. Physical stuff is what puppets are about. Jay's thing was, all, all I'm going to do is cut to this stinking puppet, and he's going to have some sort of semi-funny wisecrack. <laughs> he can't hold anything. He can't demonstrate. You know, it's like useless. He said, let's put a guy in a rat suit. It's a hell of a lot funnier. And and he was right. He was totally right. And I my memory is Ritz showed up on this... Uh, <laughs> at the office on the lot and was told he was not doing a puppet. He was going to be a guy in a rat suit. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> but he was number one, the most wonderful guy in the world. So funny, insanely talented, incredibly patient. And I mean, he was so talented him and, and, and um, in the beginning of, uh, um, Alana Ubach, that like being with those two, it, it was like having a whip cracked on my hiney because <laughs> they were so, so good that it required me to pay attention, really step up and do my best. And that that holds for the other two women as well, um, uh, Eliza and, and Senta, because of their talent. You know, it's just when you work with people like that, it's like it, all ships raise. So. Isn't it, it's a little serendipitous to me that you, a puppeteer, and Mark, a puppeteer, would suddenly find yourselves working together in live action. Do you feel like you two had some sort of unspoken puppeteer communication between the two of you? I think we, you know, he came from a what I would call like a straight puppet background. His parents were puppeteers. Uh, he did the Tonight Show. You know, he I, I think he was on the Ed Sullivan Show. They were more sort of conventional puppets doing more conventional acts. I came from like a radical anarchist, you know, <laughs> neo-expressionist puppet theater. It was like the diametric opposite. And uh, but, you know, our sensibilities crossed a lot. And um, the thing that's interesting about puppeteers is that we are conscious of how to manipulate objects you know, it's a very visual form. So the sound effects guy told me what's so great about your gestures is they have a beginning, middle and end. You know, your hand will stop. He says it's so easy to put the sound effects in because of the fact that you have this sort of notation or this this business where your hand will. Be, uh, it's hard to explain. And I'm kind of blowing my own horn, but it was <laughs> uh it was uh, it was interesting. It was great, and working with him was just just the bomb. If I may point out an example of your radical puppetry, because it is on YouTube, I watched 1988's Bette Midler's Mondo Biondo show, right, where you performed "Eating in America" at uh, Landfill. Yeah, at Meadowlands. Oh, that's uh, where that. How did that smell? And how did you come up with that routine? <laughs> Um, it already existed. 
uh, what what happened was uh, Fred Berner was the producer and the director was Tommy Schlamy, who was the guy who did uh, West Wing later on. Great name. And he did a lot of um, HBO specials, as Jay also did. Jay Dubin, the director on our show. And um, this thing came up with Bette Midler. She did a special on HBO. Her husband, Martin, is a very well-known, very renowned um, performance artist, the Kipper Kids, he and his his uh, partner, Brian. And so they wanted to do a performance art show that Bette Midler would host. And so they called me up to their office that was in the Brill building, you know, <laughs> which is just like off the hook. I remember being in the elevator with uh, Martin Scorsese with his little poodle in his hand. <laughs> You know, real building, that's like, that's where all the songwriters came out of in the, in the 50s and everything. Anyway, they said, well, how would you do it? How would you like, how if you had your way, how would you want to shoot this? I said, oh, let's do it at the dump. So we <laughs> scouted the dump in Staten Island, Fresh Kills, but I they, they ended up using um, Meadowlands, unless I had that the wrong way around. But we had to shoot in a day, and it was, you know, it's stressful. Um I got a monster headache that day because I was really concerned that we would end up on time. I wasn't the producer, but I just can't get the, <laughs> the part of me out of, I just, I, you know, that's where I come from. We're, we do everything as puppeteers, but it was a lot of fun. It was great. I showed up or no, I exited in a garbage truck on a couch with a, a very um, fulsome young woman. That was the end of the thing. So yeah, I, I was pretty happy with the way that came out. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. so cool. What, what, yeah. what a moment. Uh, okay, so a question from one of our fans watching. They want to know, was there ever a scientific experiment that you did on the show that made you nervous or maybe didn't play out the way that you meant for it to play out? Well, it was the time that the alligator or the crocodile, or I don't remember what it was, but I think it may, it's, I don't know, it was on the table and we were doing a take and it just lays there like a plate of locks. Like it doesn't do anything like all day long. And at one point I'm talking to the camera, blah, 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 blah. And it went chomp. <laughs> and I wet my pants and simultaneously ran screaming all the way to like Burbank. Uh, that was terrifying. There was the time that uh, we were doing a show with a lion and the set was closed. We always had an open set. Anybody in the lot could just come in and hang out <laughs> because, you know, we're all nobodies. Nobody gives a crap. So, you know, people could just wander in. But that day we had a closed set and it's because we had a lion on the stage. So the lion, here I am, right? Here I am. And there's the camera. And on the other side of the camera is, a, is the trainer uh, wait a minute. How did this work again? Uh, no, the lion was behind me. Excuse me. Why would the lion be behind the camera? <laughs> so anyway, the lion's behind me and you can see him and I'm in the front. And then the trainer is behind the camera and he's got like a sirloin steak on a stick and he's waving it back and forth like this. So the lion behind me is going like this, sort of looking at the steak on the stick. And the only thing between the steak and, and the lion is me. So it was like, we're not going to do like 30 takes of this shit. We're just going to, you know, bang it out and move along. Uh, so that was nerve wracking. We had a camel and I had been told by, by circus people, the camel's the most dangerous animal in, in the circus. The, I had huh. been told this in Vincennes in the 70s when we played in Vincennes at the Cartoucherie in the outskirts of Paris. Um, and then... The chimpanzee was pretty amazing. I didn't know at the time how dangerous they are. And I think I would have asked someone to have a firearm if I had known how insanely dangerous they could be. Rarely, but, you know, they're very, very strong. Wow. So there's a long answer to a short question. So, so all having to deal with the animal world. I'm assuming that they had multiple Wranglers on set, though, to make sure that you weren't dinner, right? <laughs> yeah. And the guy, the guy who, there were two Wranglers with the crocodile. And one of them was like dressed sort of like J. Crew, you know, <laughs> very clean cut, waspy looking. And the other guy was like crocodile Dundee, you know, with the ostrich skin jacket and the... <laughs> And the um, 
you know, the hat and the whole thing. And he was like missing a finger. Oh my God. So it's like, it's one of these guys I trust. <laughs> now, in addition to yourself, the show also incorporated a few other uh, bizarre artists, shall we say. One being Mark Mothersbaugh, the lead singer of Devo, who did the theme music and he did all the other music for the show? The first season, or maybe the first two seasons, but then they replaced him with one of his assistants that, you know, at a much lower rate, unfortunately. Right. Right. Happens. It happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the next one is that the set was designed by Wayne White, who did Pee Wee's Playhouse and a bunch of other things. Yes, and is a very renowned contemporary painter who's done really well, and a puppeteer. Um, and he also did the animations on an old Omega computer. Uh, he did all that Ed Roth, Ed Big Daddy Roth inspired, um, uh, Hot Rod inspired custom culture. And he's a big bluegrass fan. So I used to go hang out with him. He's a very simpatico cat. And Bob Green was the guy who, uh, what Wayne did was he made sketches, but Bob is the one who actually dressed the set. He went and found all the stuff and dressed. So he was also incredibly brilliant because the set was beautiful. It was beautiful to be on. It was fun to be in. It was a really nice environment. Uh, dangerous. It was wires and glass and all kinds of crap <laughs> everywhere. But we used to eat lunch in the, in the living room there and um, yeah, it was beautiful. They were both, they both did an amazing job. And our fearless leader was Mark Waxman. He was his executive producer and he ran the writers, um, and they did an awesome job. They, they were, uh, they were taking like the theory of relativity and, and distilling it into six minutes for six to 10 year olds. I mean, I, I would not want to have to do that, <laughs> but they did it. You know, they were amazing. Well, so, out of curiosity, yeah. what what were your favorite subjects growing up outside of, of, you know, puppetry, maybe? Did you have a subject that you liked most in school? Were you a science kid? Uh, I was a, uh, English and history. Um, awesome. I The things I remember the most from school was uh, writing essays. I wrote one about Joseph Lister, which is a scientific subject. He was the guy who discovered... Um, that uh, germs came from the sewer and all the rest of it. And that's what made people sick. I mean, he was one of the people to sort of discover that. Listerine is named after him. And uh, I love doing a deep dive and doing research uh, about going to the library and reading all these books and composing the paper. I mean, these made a big impression. I wrote one about Charles Lindbergh and the America First neo-Nazi, or not neo-Nazi, old Nazi. You know, he was a Nazi. Uh, I wrote a paper about that. That was fascinating. And then also learning to write the Strunken Wagner, Wagnalls, whatever it's called, and E.B. White, uh, the elements of style. I, th I, you know, this was a great gift that I got in my schooling was, was how to write. Now, I also did my research and I uncovered that you were also on a somewhat lost sketch show called The Unnaturals. Oh, can you tell me anything about it? It had to Paul Feig, Siobhan Fallon Hogan, Tim Blake Nelson. It was a very bizarre, and it, there's only a few clips that exist online. Do you remember anything called? about this? What's it called? The Unnaturals? Yeah, I have a vague recollection. <laughs> <laughs> I was on The Equalizer, too. Um, that show, I played a hotel clerk. <laughs> and... Um, I remember one of the lead actors leaned down, leaned over to me and says, if you don't say that line faster, the scene's going to end up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> I was extremely nervous. And, uh, you know, that was him being helpful. <laughs> uh, sure. But, yeah, the unnatural, I don't remember that. I did a pilot with the guy, uh, Fred Newman, who was the guy who did the sound effects on Garrison Keillor's show. You remember that? The sound effects he would do for the stories. And Fred was, he was awesome. He has a, a book called Mouth Sounds. And it mm. was a it was a kid show for PBS. And I don't remember what I did on the show. I have no recollection, but I, <laughs> I did have an open mic moment. Um, 
where there was an open mic and my voice was being broadcast in the studio and I didn't know it. And fortunately, what I had to say was, wow, Fred Newman, he is fantastic. What a talent. So not, oh, the guy's a douchebag. I hate this guy. I would allow the kid with my coffee. But, you know, it, a really heartfelt, this guy is brilliant. Awesome. That's so also we, a good, you know, a good scheme if you're trying to score points with the person is to have the, you know, complimentary hot mic moment. Yeah. Well, it didn't work because the show didn't get picked up. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was fun. And um, I, you know, I didn't really want to work as an actor. I kind of realized that because while I was doing Beekman, I auditioned for a part as an FBI agent in uh, Mission Impossible. And I remember reading the lines and being like, oh, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be so, pretend I'm some FBI agent. Like, why would I do that in some crappy movie? So, I, yeah, I was like, that was the last time I did it. It's just I want to make my own work. It, it may mean I'm obscure. I, it may mean I don't make a good living, whatever, whatever. I don't care. You only get a certain amount of time on the planet. You might as well do what you want to do. That's so true. So true. Well, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, Paul, was that 52% of the audience was actually adults. So what do you think made the show so popular for both kids and adults alike? Well, I think um, adults liked the sort of soupy sales, um, Uncle Floyd uh, sensibility, Pee Wee Herman. Uh they liked the humor and the sort of different levels of humor, like Warner Brothers cartoons would have, you know, sort of jokes for the adults, jokes for the kids. But my neighbor upstairs um, in, in New York, in my loft, he said, well, I watched the show because I know I'll understand the humor, the, the humor. I know <laughs> I'll understand the science. You know, in other words, adults would say, oh, it's a kid's show about science. I will understand the science. So it was a gateway for them to understand what is unfortunately commonly perceived as this sort of monolithic, you know, impermeable, impermeable. Imp you know, impermeable. Yeah. You put a B yeah. in there, but it's fine. Yeah. It's good. We'll take yeah. It. You yeah. know, opaque subject matter that they feel like I don't I'm not good at science I don't know science blah 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 if it's on a kid show I'll get it so I think that had a lot to do with it very fair um you did also get to work with one of my favorites on the show uh would you like to tell everyone who played your mother oh yeah um yes um Edith Bunker yes Jean um, Stapleton Jean Stapleton oh my who God. the line producer is June Stapleton's, uh, I, I, what's her first name again? Jean. Jean. Uh, it w was uh, Jean's daughter, the line producer, who, who's the person who does Hi. all the work. Um, <laughs> and she was great. She was just great. She was wonderful and sweet and enthusiastic and excited to be on the show. And there's a blooper of her where she's putting a uh, beak phone thing, which is a set of headphones that had some gimmick on them. And she lifts them and she puts them onto my head. And while she does it, she pushes the wig way back. <laughs> and she, the wig is way back and my real hairline is exposed. And then she's like, oh dear. And then she tries to pull the whole thing and she's pulling on the wig and stuff. Uh, yeah, she was great. And we had a rule on the show that if anything went wrong, you had to keep going until the director said cut. So if you drop something, if something fell apart, whatever, you were not allowed to stop. You were supposed to vamp and ad lib and come up with a gag and see what happens. And sometimes they ended up in the show. Sometimes the, the boop, you know, the boobers were great. And sometimes they just ended up in the blooper reel. <laughs> that one I have to find. Yeah, good luck. I don't think it's out there. If it can um, be found, RJ will find it. I will I'll go to a cast reunion or something and see what I can dig up. Yeah, I often show it when I do live performances in um Latin America. 
um, Beekman, it, it turns out I went to Mexico on this gig. I was going to play a 600 seat theater at uh, UNAM in Mexico City. And they said, oh, we want to move you to 800 seat theater. I'm like, OK. Then they said, oh, we want to do it outside. I said, OK. And then he said, oh, we want to add two more shows. I'm like, OK. So 18,000 people <laughs> later and, you know, needing 20 security people getting in and out of the venue, having a press conference with 100 journalists. The mayor of Mexico City came <laughs> to the show. I mean, I had no idea. None of us had any idea. And the show is a huge phenomenon in Brazil and in, in Mexico, Argentina, in um Uruguay and Paraguay and Chile. And there's something about the sensibility of the show that really keys into the Latin sensibility. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it could be the fact that the character was very close to the camera mm. and was looking at the kids and that created an emotional connection that was really strong. So out of curiosity, uh, in the other countries, do they dub your voice or do they use subtitles? No, they dub the voice. H have you gotten to meet any of the voice dubs for Beekman? Yeah, I've met uh, both the guy who does Spanish and the guy who does uh, Portuguese. Very And cool. uh, I've worked with the guy um, um, who, who does the Spanish in, in Mexico. He will often accompany me on stage and do simultaneous translation. Awesome. Oh, King, do you have any explanation? Did anyone say we love you here because I feel like this has kind of like almost like a Telemundo morning show quality to it. You know, yeah, I think uh, it's kind of like um, what was that movie Finding Rodriguez or Finding what was the guy's name? Um, the, the pop singer in the 70s who became a super phenomenon in um, South Africa. <laughs> and then uh, what was it? Yeah. is a film finding, and he has a, a Latin name. I can't remember what it, what it's called now, but it had that kind of aspect to it. I mean, I ask people all the time what it is and they'll say, Oh, it's funny and it's different. You explain science really well. I think a lot of it had to do with that, direct address and being close to the camera. A lot of latchkey kids, you know, they'd get home from school, they'd watch the show. And, you know, for kids, there's no difference between a person on the TV talking to them and a person in the room talking to them. There's not a big difference. So they can create a, a, a kind of an emotional attachment relationship with the talent on the TV, which is <laughs> kind of creepy and kind of great. <laughs> now, you did... Four seasons, 91 episodes. Did you know that you were going to end? Did they know when the last episodes were going to be the last? Or did they say, we'll see you next season, and then it never came back? Well, the, the thing that you want to do back in the day, in those days, was you wanted to make enough episodes so you could go into second-run syndication, because that's where the money was made. You know, they made money with Seinfeld. They made plenty of dough. Once it went into second run uh, um, syndication, okay. that's when the billions and billions w were made. Uh, in in those days, I think you needed like 124 episodes or something like that with a conventional sitcom, for example, an adult show. With a kid show, you only needed 91 episodes. That was the sweet spot. And uh, the reason is because the... Uh, the audience grows up and leaves. <laughs> you know, the kids, they vamoose. They're like, this is kid stuff. I'm out of here. Uh, so we knew when it got to 91, there was not a lot of incentive for them to keep making the shows. Hmm, interesting. Well, RJ, I was going to say, do you want to ask maybe one more question? Then we'll go into our game. Yes. I want to know <laughs> the, uh, the first thing you did when you finished Beekman. Like, were you itching to get out? Did you have idea? Like, you've done, what, 11 full-length one-man shows? I think it's 15 or 16. Oh, all right. Well, excuse me. But did you, <laughs> did you have it in your head that you wanted to go back to that immediately? Did you have ideas? Like, what was the first thing after Beekman for you? Uh, we did a bunch of projects, Jay and I, Jay Dubin, the director. We did a, a, a Beekman 
uh, promo for hydrogen fuel for the Department of Energy. Um, we did a few more things like that for Sony and I don't remember what else. We pitched an Ed Big Daddy Roth Rat Fink movie around town and worked with uh, Ed Roth um, and he kiboshed the deal. We did a pilot for ABC of Ripley's Believe It or Not with the late, great um, uh, Dean Stockwell, um, oh. who was uh, incredible and awesome. Did that with my my cousin, uh, George Zaloom. And a few other Hollywoody things. And then I just slowly started getting back into my puppetry work and dropped the, the, the whole... Uh, the commercial thing. I made a feature film with the uh, painter Sandow Burke and his wife, Elise Pignolet, and the director, uh, Sean Meredith, of Dante's Inferno. And it's a toy theater, paper puppet, full-length version of the Italian classic, uh, Dante's Inferno, and a couple of other films. That's amazing. Uh, I do like this question before we get to the game. So would you be open for a Beekman's World like reboot or new episodes for like Disney or Netflix. Yeah, I would be open to that. You know, the trick would be we we lost uh, Mark Ritz. He died of cancer um, over ten years ago, and it would be very tough to reproduce the production values, which were very high. The show cost two hundred grand an episode. And nobody spends that kind of money on kids shows anymore. That's a lot, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the best way to do a reboot, frankly, would be to do it with puppets because you can do a lot with puppets on the cheap and it would be so different. But, yeah, you know, I'm up for I'm up for anything. I think that'd be amazing. Well, Paul, we have a game. This is a game of would you rather. There is no wrong answer. So whatever you want to pick as the correct answer is correct. So we're going to bring up these graphics, and here we go. Would you rather... RJ, do you want to read the first one? Yes, since you've kind of done both in an odd sense. Would you rather work on The Muppet Show or work on Sesame Street? Uh, Jeez, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's, it that's works. We'll call too. it a draw. It's a push. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. All right, Paul. Would you rather... Do, 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 do. Have a crossover. Oh, okay. This one second. Okay. Would you rather have a talking pet penguin or have a talking pet rat? Oh, well, definitely a talking pet rat. <laughs> Good choice. Good choice. That's a no-brainer. All, right. <laughs> All right. Next one. Now, uh, would you rather have a crossover show, a signing show with Bill Nye, or a, a puppet show with Jeff Dunham? <laughs> Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, hmm. I, I don't know. I don't we'll know. call that a push, yeah. too. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to skip that one. Are I'm you? Again. <laughs> did you uh, meet Bill at all? Because, I mean, it's in, conflated in my head, but obviously it seemed like you were, it was like Coke and Pepsi. It was Bill Nye and Beekman. Yeah, I did. I met him a couple of times uh, at um, different events. The um, I don't recall what they were, but yeah, I met him a couple of times. He he said in the press that his show is better than ours because he's a scientist, and I'm a what did he call me an actor? And then he called me a performance <laughs> artist. Um, but I I've never I um, I I have no comments neither here nor there. I mean the more. <laughs> Pu more puppet shows and the more science shows we have, the better as far as I'm concerned. Perfect. All right. Here's the next one. Would you rather go back in time and have a conversation? Oh, wh why am I having these all out of order? I apologize. Okay. Would you rather film an episode of Beekman's World on the ocean floor or film an episode in <laughs> space? <laughs> well, uh, I think I'm more curious about the ocean floor. Hi. Um, I, I, I love swimming. It's my hobby and open water swimming, love swimming in the ocean. So I'd be very tempted to, to, uh, to be on the ocean floor for sure. See one of those lantern fish, you know, all the, the angler fish. Oh, those things scare me so much. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, would you rather go back in time and have a conversation with Buffalo Bob of Howdy Doody fame or 
have a conversation with Don Herbert? Uh, I think it'd be interesting to talk to Buffalo Bob. Um, I think it was uh, Rufus and Margot Rose who did uh, Howdy Doody, the puppet on the show. And so I'd be interested to talk to him about the puppetry. You know, Don Herbert didn't have very nice things to say about Bill Nye and, and me. He said, I don't know why they have to be funny. So he wasn't a big fan of ours. Uh, yes. Yet, would you like to explain how you how the show paid tribute to him? Well, the two penguins are called Don and Herb. And that was the tribute uh, that the writers came up. And uh, Mark Ritz was one of the puppeteers uh, who operated the Penguin Puppets. Uh, and the guys who did the voiceovers were two of the biggest voiceover guys in the Hollywood business. They were by far the wealthiest people involved with the show. They used to show up in Rolls Royce to work. <laughs> a a nice awesome. gig. Awesome. All right. Here's the next one. Would you rather have to listen to Whip It by Devo on repeat for 24 hours straight or listen to Blinded Me with Science by Tommy Dombart on repeat? Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a great question because I love both of those songs, but um, I think I'd go for the blinded, blinded by science because uh, I, I like it just a little bit more. I love that song. I loved it when it came out. It's great, great tune. Great tune, great video, great everything. Science. All right. If you had to update Beekman for today's children, would you rather? Oh God picture there we go have have beekman have a mohawk or should beekman have a mullet to relate to today's kids <laughs> uh oh, wow that mullet man who's rocking that mullet is that uh oh, you, you certain surprised. parts of the country yeah. it, play, it plays uh certain areas yeah a lot of wrestlers too <laughs> i'll go for the mohawk Okay. I like it. I can see it. I can see it. All right. So we have one final one, Paul, and here it is. Would you rather have Neil Patrick Harris as one of your lab assistants or Lady Gaga? Huh. I, gosh, uh, I think Lady Gaga. Um, I think she's a very interesting person and an interesting artist. And I, I think the same about uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Uh, I think he's a very gifted guy, very talented. But I think uh, Lady Gaga, I would be a little bit more Gaga about to, to, be, <laughs> sure. to work with. Sure. Yeah, Gaga, you, your mohawk. It's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have, there is an obscure comment here that I want to draw attention to. Uh, a viewer named SM wrote, I picked up an autographed headshot of Paul's at my landlady's estate sale. I believe she did PR or marketing. Do you have any, do you know that there's a PR person who's selling your headshots? Are you okay with this? Yeah, I'm fine with it. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I hope you didn't spend more than 50 cents on it. And if you get tired of it, it makes a really great impervious liner for your birdcage. So keep that in there mind. There you go. It's a multi-purpose object. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, before we do wrap this up, is there any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with here today? Well, what I'm doing now is I'm doing little puppet movies on my YouTube channel, which is Fruit of Zaloom. My last so name. Good. Z A L O O M. So I have a YouTube, and it's just one word, Fruit of Zaloom. Um, and there's, I have five or six of them where I use Santa Claus kitsch figures um, to make little hyperactive five minute comedy films about environmental and political concerns and it's satire and all the rest of it. And I started doing it in the pandemic and uh, I continued. Um, my artistic partner, Lynn Jeffries and I make these things in the garage. And we're actually going to premiere the next one on March 10th, which is World Puppetry Day. And the theme is the sea. And the show is about um, uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So it's right. kind of super appropriate um, for March 10th. So, yeah, check it out. Come and, come and take a look at the, the Santa videos on, uh, on YouTube. 
Fabulous. I have seen them. I like them. And I imagine your garage is just like a little Christmas village now at this point. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's crazy. There's uh, 300 Santas in there. A lot of <laughs> elves and gnomes and candy canes and all kinds of crap. And you have played them. I saw that you were Santa and you were an elf. Yeah. Did yeah, you enjoy I, did you enjoy playing Santa or Beekman better? Uh it's just completely different. <laughs> it's just a different shtick. Yes. Uh, you know, being Beekman, it's just basically me with a little more shoulder roll, a little bit more New York, lots of hands in the frame. Um, I love doing it. The executive producer Waxman, he said to me, he says the character is like you, but more New York and more animated. And Jay used to yell at me. He'd say, give me the bada bing guy. Give me the bada bing guy. Because he's a, he's a real uh, Dems and Doe's uh, New Yorker from uh, Coney Island. So, ah. yeah. Fabulous. Well, this has been such an absolute delight. Thank you so much. Uh, before we do let you go, we're going to go over our upcoming guests that we have coming up on the stream. So next week, we have Nicholas from All American Rejects. On March 8th, we're welcoming Bert Ward. On March 10th, we're welcoming John Schneider. And on March 15th, we have Josh V. And Paul, thank you so much. You have made both of our millenniums. This has been such an absolute delight. And we're going to check out Fruit of Zaloom on YouTube on National Puppet Day. You said March 10th. Yeah, and there are videos up there now if you have time to waste. Well, we got plenty of time. Uh, RJ, before we let you go, anything you want to plug? Yes, uh, Fruit of Zaloom on YouTube. And you can watch all, how many are there? Five or six? Something <clears throat> like that, yeah. You can watch a series. You can have a whole night. You can have a Santa stream. Indeed. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, on that note, we have we hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your weekend and we will see you guys next week. Be safe everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>